have taken telecommunicators to a whole different level. Uh, the professionalism, they're no longer looked upon as, uh, as a low-end job. In fact, they're looked upon now, in my opinion, as those of uh, uh, doctors. Okay, maybe not that far. <laughs> okay? Attorneys. Uh, you know, that level is high up though. Professionalism has uh, definitely gone up. When people need to know who they turn to for help, they know it's only three numbers, or if you're in another country, it might be four or five. But they know it's going to be there right there for them. Going back to system design, all components, all the people components in an EMS system have protocols, they have standards that have to be met, there's quality assurance, and that way, going back to patient care, we're ensuring that our patients are getting the absolute very best. The exact wording is so critical in, in telemedicine. So we evolved from this, you know, what was really a protocol guideline combination into very, very specific wording. And, and we evolved that science and turned it into something that's um, really remarkable today, where single words in the protocol are, are argued at nauseum in standards um, but for a very, very good cause. By the time I was ready to graduate, I uh, found out there were some, uh, a number of places, I think there were about 10 places, only of which that I think three or four were what they called accredited by the uh, uh, American College of Emergency Physicians. And I ended up going to charity. They had an interest in uh, some pre-hospital care stuff. The hospital system was such that because it's a, basically a free system, everybody comes there. So patients came from the, the, the point of being born there to when they died there. And the medical record charts reflected that. An average patient's chart was probably about six, six inches to nine inches thick if they were coming as an adult or an older patient to the hospital. We had an issue here at our dispatch center posted on the quality assurance, little bulletin board electronically. And so I kept tracking that to see what the feedback was. And it was really fun to see people from Austria and Italy and all that throw in their, you know, feedback to that. And it was just kind of mind boggling, you know, the, the depth and breadth of the protocols that you have around the world. And, you know, everybody's speaking pretty much the same language when it comes to doing EMS issues. Uh, I think it was uh, around about the mid 1980s, probably around 1986, 1987. And I read an article, one of those articles that really jump out at you and, and, and really sort of seize you. Uh, and it was an article written by Dr. Clawson, uh, which talked about a method of ensuring that the control centre would be able to interact with the public in a, an intelligent and an organised way and provide the sort of help that the public need. On the, the 7th of July 2005, we were able to use our catastrophic incident plan, which basically said that any calls that came in that were the lowest category calls, our EMDs, our call takers, were able to say, we're not sending you an ambulance today because of this incident. And we were able to do that up to the third tier of calls that we use because we had confidence in the way the system worked. Clinics in emergency, uh, follow-up clinics, saw one, one point, uh, I think it was 1.5 million patients a year. Uh, but this was, this was the place where um, I really had a uh, practically a religious experience that here I am I'm basically an intern and I'm seeing all these patients in clinic they were seen anywhere from um, three to six weeks ago had their labs drawn then and the high blood thing was the one that really got my attention because you'd have these lab tests and they were from way back you didn't know for sure what it meant um, you pick up the chart and the charts this thick and the patient's sitting there and you don't have a lot of experience and you're going, what in the heck now? The resident, chief resident there was one of the emergency medicine residents. It's a big guy named J.V. Jones. He was from, originally from Baylor. And I said, J.V., he says, what's the matter? You look awful. And I said, I, well, other than no sleep, I'm um, just, I don't know what's going on here. And he said, I just, it's like every time somebody comes in, I'm reinvent, reinventing the wheel. And he pulled his coat open like this, and the white, the big white coat, and there was an inner pocket. I had the big outer pockets, but it was an inner pocket. He pulled out this set of, like, I thought it was recipe cards. And it had an elastic band around it, and, you know, they were like, you know, I guess five by eight. And he said, what you need, my man, is a protocol. 
I said, a protocol? And he said, a protocol. I said, you mean a cookbook? Cookbook my ass. He said, this is Charity Hospital. You've seen the flow. You can't exist here without one. He says, he says, hey, can I borrow that tonight? He says, good idea. So I took it home and I looked at it and I thought, well, this is interesting. If this do that, this is what this means. If that is that and that, that, then go over here, then do this. And I said, can I make a copy of this on the next, next day? And he says, yeah, sure, absolutely. So, you know, I scribbled out, you know, my own thing. And the first time I used it in clinic, it was absolutely amazing. I got, I got through faster, saw more patients, did a better job, was more consistent, and the patients were happier. And I remember seeing him later and looking at him, he said, told you. And that was really the point where I thought, hmm, this is, this is interesting. Never thought more about it really after that. People said that, oh, this won't work, and here's all the reasons why. Just like we learn about in EMD class, and we teach in EMD class and in the EFD courses. But, uh, you know, once you stick with it and it's the right thing to do, you know, it'll take care of itself.